Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Uh, And today we're going to talk about what is perhaps the most famous of all images in Christian art, or definitely one of the most famous, uh, the Pieta. And I was originally going to research just the attack on Michelangelo's Pieta in 1972. And we are going to talk about that. But as I got to researching that, I ended up down this sort of wonderful rabbit hole of this image in art history as depicted by many artists over time. And specifically the ones that Michelangelo worked on, because there were more than one. And we will talk about all of those. Uh, So this episode ended up really being a little bit of a smorgasbord. There is a little bit of light art history. There is a little bit about Michelangelo, but we're not really doing a biography of him. We're just talking about these works of art and kind of some of his life surrounding them, not in great depth. And uh, a bit about art defacement, more than one, in fact. And we're also going to touch on the great care that is needed to move uh, a sculpture of the nature of the famous Pieta that Michelangelo worked on. So we're getting a little bit of all of that in today's episode. Just in case you don't know, the Pieta in the general sense is any depiction or representation of the Virgin Mary mourning over Christ's dead body. I don't know why I suddenly was like, that sounded so bleak. Right? Well, it is bleak. (laughs) They're very sad, usually. Yeah. Well, obviously, the word derives from the Latin word for pity. However, the use of this word to apply to these pieces comes after they start to appear in art. Yeah, we see them starting these images of of Mary holding Christ uh, after the crucifixion around the 13th century. But that word doesn't really come in in that sense until, I think, the 1600s. So... Another thing that's interesting is that although this is a significant moment in the Christian religion, this scene and this this imagery, that scene actually isn't present in the Gospels. Like, there's not a specific moment where they describe this. Uh, though Christ's crucifixion is in there, the descent from the cross, uh, or the, the deposition, as it's often called, uh, lamentation, Christ being laid on the ground, and the entombment are all there in the New Testament, but there really is no description of Mary cradling her son, yet it became a really important image. In a lecture given by the Right Reverend Lord Harry's at the Museum of London in March 2015, the speaker outlines the factors that he believes contribute to the origin of the Pieta as a significant scene in religious art, despite it not actually being something that's ever mentioned in Scripture. Harry's describes the development of devotional images versus narrative images. And whereas narrative religious art clearly shows a story playing out, devotional imagery takes these images out of their narrative context. And this came about in the 1300s in relation to an intense religious reverence. These images were basically so that the devoted could fixate and think on the suffering of Christ as a part of personal prayer and meditation. So as part of a group of common devotional images to come out of Germany, specifically during the 1300s, this scene of the Pieta emerged. This is due to the fact that Mary, as a religious figure, was gaining a greater position, so her suffering, too, was to be contemplated in devotionals. Mary's pain and lament over Christ's death had long been a part of religious writings before the visual of this moment of grief became a standard. There are three main types of Pieta. The first is the early German in which the torso of Christ is upright, with the head, arms, and legs at diagonal placements in relation to the torso. Christ is often portrayed in a smaller size compared to Mary. This harkens back to his child state. Sometimes when you see these, they're a bit jarring because he looks like an adult man, but he's very small in relation to Mary. Uh, And his suffering is usually depicted in, in great depth and with clarity. He looks like he's in terrible pain. Mary, for her part, is often shown in deep sorrow. Her face is often contorted with grief. And the first of these images in this style date back to, uh, again, the early 1300s. The second type, which came about in the late 15th century, is characterized by Christ's body depicted with a continuous curve. Mary's grief is often more restrained in these, and she often holds her hands in a prayer position rather than holding the body of her son. 
And the third type, which also dates back to the 15th century, is characterized by the body of Christ in a horizontal, usually straighter position. And these often feature more people in the tableau. Uh, It's not just Christ and Mary. And there's often a peaceful landscape in the background, and sometimes there is an architectural feature. Christ's wounds are frequently, though not always, less of a focus. It's a little bit of a softer image. It's not so fraught with grief. Between 1300 and 1500, personal iconography became a lot more common. Previously to that, art had been more of a public concept. So during this period, works of art representing the Pieta became more prevalent in people's private homes instead of just out in public spaces. So it is a little bit early on, but in the next segment, it runs kind of long, and we're going to talk about the three different versions of the Pieta created by Michelangelo. So we're going to pause and do our sponsor break now so we can keep all of that chunk together. In the 1490s, Michelangelo, still very young at this point, traveled from Florence uh, to Venice and to Bologna, and eventually ended up in Rome in 1496. When Michelangelo was commissioned to create his famous Pietà, he was only 24. The contract was signed on August 27, 1498. That document is actually now part of the Vatican's collection. The work was intended for the funeral chapel of St. Petronia in St. Peter's Basilica, The person who requested the art was the French ambassador, Cardinal Belair de la Grilla. The piece would be part of the decor of the chapel where he was to be interred and where funeral services would be given for other people as well. Once tasked with this piece, uh, the artist Michelangelo set out to find the most perfect block of marble he could find. He found one eventually, which he claimed had no faults, and he set to work. Michelangelo worked on Jean de Belair's commission from 1498 to 1500, and he worked in the round, so he was able to access all sides of the piece at once. And the finished sculpture weighs uh, three tons. Belair had died in 1499, so he did not get to see the completed work. This sculpture, which a lot of our listeners have probably seen, at least in pictures, is spectacular. We'll include a link in the show notes with a virtual tour of it online. It's really unique in its peacefulness. Mary appears to be very young. It's an appearance that Michelangelo attributed to her purity when people criticized his choice to show her as a youth. The torso wound of Christ is minimized, and there is, above almost all else, the sense of serenity to the work rather than suffering. Mary is not directly touching the body of Christ in this sculpture. There's actually a cloth carved in between her hand and the side of his torso where she's supporting him. And this denotes the sacred nature of his physical body. The relative sizes of the two figures is also something to note. While her head is proportional to her sons in the sculpture, Mary's body is larger. Unlike in the early German style of Pieta works, it appears to be more of a visual and logistical need in Michelangelo's sculpture. Mary's body needed to be large enough to support her son, and the depth of the cloth draped around Mary gives the sculpture an incredibly realistic effect, but also hides the size disparity. And this commissioned piece was also intended to sit above the altar in the funeral chapter, chapel. So part of the size disparity was possibly to add to a visual illusion, both of Mary offering up Christ, just as mourners were offering up their deceased loved ones. Uh, and also, if she had been a normal size in the sculpture, like if you were standing near it, uh, she then would have appeared unrealistically tiny once the sculpture was placed in its intended position in the chapel. And we know Michelangelo kind of thought about these things in other sculptures. It comes up, people will talk about the David sometimes and how it was meant to be displayed and how the proportions were affected. Uh, so we know that he thought about this kind of thing uh, and that, you know, he was keenly aware of how eye and sight line and presentation would affect the need for size. This was the only one of Michelangelo's sculptures that he carved his full name into. Allegedly, he'd overheard visitors attributing the work to another artist after it had been installed in the chapel, and so he made his mark on the ribbon draped across Mary's chest by night. Later on, though, he regretted having done that, and he vowed to never again put his name on his work because he found it to be prideful. 
And this sculpture was so well received that it was a really significant factor in the launch of Michelangelo's career. This was, again, very early on. He was in his 20s. Immediately upon its reveal, this was seen as a masterpiece and other artists flocked to the chapel to see it. And this is sort of one of those wonderfully rare cases of an artist actually being appreciated in his time rather than after it, because Michelangelo lived another 64 years after completing the Pietà. So he was able to see the effect his work had on people and how beloved it was from basically day one of his existence. It kind of made him a rock star. So the Pietà that you think of when you hear the name Michelangelo, that one that we have just been talking about, is his most famous but not his only depiction of that moment. His second Pietà, also known as the Florentine Pietà and the Deposition, was worked on over a number of years beginning in 1547, and this piece was not commissioned. It was intended by the artist to adorn his own final resting place, and as such was something of a passion project. The Florentine Pietà is kind of a puzzler. Its meaning is not immediately clear. Both the stage of the Christ narrative and who's included in the tableau have really been debated by art historians at great length. In the narrative context, some elements of the piece indicate that it's a representation of the deposition. Others hint that it's more of a pieta, and yet others lead people to interpretation that it's supposed to be the entombment of Christ. It's even possible that Michelangelo intended to blend multiple narratives into this one work. And there are four figures in this sculpture, so already we're at a departure from the classic Mary and Christ set up. Uh, one is Christ, one is the Virgin Mary, and another person is Mary Magdalene. But the fourth figure is where the confusion and the variant interpretations really come into play. This fourth figure is a hooded figure, and it's male and stands above the other three, and it is not entirely clear to everyone who it's supposed to be. I will say, when I say that, there are people who believe very firmly that they know who it's supposed to be, but debate continues. It could be the biblical figure, Joseph of Arimathea, who provided his own intended tomb as the resting place for Jesus after the crucifixion. It could be Nicodemus, the Pharisee who appears in the Gospel of John and assists in the burial of Jesus. The Nicodemus interpretation is a common one. If the figure is Joseph of Arimathea, that figure, combined with the presence of Mary Magdalene, would suggest that this is an entombment piece, as those two figures are traditionally more associated with art depicting that phase of the narrative. If it is Nicodemus, it may hint more strongly at being the deposition, as both Joseph and Nicodemus are featured in that element in the narrative traditionally in art, but Nicodemus is not normally featured in depictions of the entombment. In 1555, Michelangelo attempted to destroy the Florentine Pietà. He was successful in breaking off Christ's left leg and arm, and he chipped other sections. And why he did this is unclear, but there are a number of theories, and the truth may lie in some combination of several or all of them. One is that the artist was troubled by a particularly problematic vein in the marble, which frustrated him to the point of despair, and he just got angry and wanted to smash it. Anybody who's done something creative can know that those moments happen. Uh, Another is that his servant had been nagging him to finish the piece, which made him irritated with the whole enterprise, again, to the point where he was just frustrated and angry. Those two reasons were given by Michelangelo himself when pressed on the matter Uh, in the account written by one of his contemporaries, Giorgio Vasari. The third and fourth theories in exactly what happened are a little bit more involved. So the first of these involves the placement of Christ's leg, which is slung across his mother's lap. And that this was a problematic symbol that Michelangelo believed uh, could be misconstrued or that he felt that he hadn't properly captured. So at this point in art history, a leg placed in another's lap held a sexual meaning. It suggested that the, the pair involved in this crossing of legs across laps were romantically or erotically entwined. And for Christ to have his leg in his mother's lap, though, actually easily fit in with the symbolism of Mary representing the church as the bride of Christ. So this was not necessarily an issue. And there was existing art at the time that included the leg of Christ draped across Mary as he was uh, taken down in the deposition and and is in a state where the body is not supported by the self. So it's, it's drooping and it's falling. 
It is possible, however, though, that Michelangelo was concerned that there could be confusion, and so he intended to alter this piece by first removing the leg. So it was less of a destruction situation and more of a let's erase and start over and fix some pieces. The fourth theory involves the hooded figure again. It's often been discussed that the Nicodemus figure was also intended to be a self-portrait of Michelangelo, As Nicodemus had connection to sculpting, this would have been a pretty natural move on the part of the artist. But Michelangelo had become more involved with a school of belief known as Nicodemism, which uh, didn't wish to separate from the Catholic Church, but also held beliefs more in line with Protestant values. He may have intended to remove his likeness as Nicodemus from the work in order to avoid suspicion that he was actually a religious dissenter. Eventually, Michelangelo consented to allow one of his pupils, Tiberio Calcagni, to restore the piece, but not the leg, which may give credence to the slung leg theory. Calcagni's work uh, was eventually completed. He did restore the other elements that had been broken, and it is now on display at the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo in Florence, Italy. In the 1550s, Michelangelo began yet a third Pietà sculpture, the Rondonini Pieta. He worked on this piece right up until the week of his death in 1564. Like the Florentine Pieta, this work was intended for himself rather than as a commission, and it breaks from the structure of the earlier works depicting this moment. Instead of Mary holding her son in front of her, she stands behind him, not supporting him. It almost looks from some angles as though he is actually supporting her. And this is a less refined and nuanced work than his two other pietas. If you look at photographs of them, you can tell, obviously, by comparison to the Roman pieta, which is just this spectacular, beautiful, realistic looking thing. This is not at that level. And in part, that was because near the time of his death, he hacked apart a lot of this statue and intended to start over. And he retained only one of Christ's arms from the original part of his work. But now we're going to jump back to Michelangelo's Roman pieta. In 1964, the sculpture was loaned to the New York World's Fair, where it was displayed as part of the Vatican Pavilion behind bulletproof glass. More specifically, it was displayed behind seven sheets of bulletproof plexiglass, each of which weighed about 700 pounds, which is about 318 kilograms. But just to get the sculpture to New York from the Vatican took an incredible and careful effort. Properly packing and transporting this priceless piece was a work of really careful engineering. A special committee called the Vatican Pavilion Transport Committee was formed to address this task. And one of the challenges involved here was that no one really knew for certain precisely how delicate or fragile or strong the statue was at this point. It had been sitting in the Vatican for hundreds of years, and there was a danger of internal fissures in the marble that couldn't be seen uh, just from external examination, but that could cause it to crack if it was bumped or moved in the wrong way. When the piece had been moved uh, within the Vatican roughly two centuries prior to this New York adventure, the left hand of the Virgin Mary had suffered damage. So there was a very real awareness of the danger involved in an overseas voyage. Radiologists from Eastman Kodak were called in to make films of the Pieta, and the marble was determined to be perfect, although x-rays did clearly show pins that had been used to repair the damaged hand. Just the same, the engineers working on the packaging approached the job with the assumption that there were indeed fissures, so they designed the most shockproof ride that they possibly could. There were three nesting cases initially made for the job. The exterior case was steel, and inside that were two wooden cases, and inside those was the Pieta. And the weight of the cases, the statue, and all of the packing materials had to be carefully calculated to ensure that as the parcel traveled across the Atlantic Ocean on a ship, any shock would be at an absolute minimum, and that all physical extensions of the art, so the pieces that are separate away from the main 
uh, central piece would be carefully cradled and supported with the void spaces carefully managed and braced. Uh, If you have access to JSTOR, one of my sources on this is a very fantastic and very technical article about all of this, which includes tables of calculation for static stress and all kinds of other testing laid out in graph and table form. So if you're interested in the nitty gritty of the engineering around this, I highly recommend you go take a peek at that. To test the design, a plaster replica of another Michelangelo statue, Moses, was used to perform drop tests from heights ranging from 107 to 260 centimeters in similar packaging. The combination of nesting cases and loose foam fill proved successful in this testing. Compression testing was also performed. Eventually, the second inner case was abandoned to enable the use of more foam polystyrene, which added both cushion and buoyancy should things go awry at sea. I can't imagine how stressed I would be if I were one of the people tasked with figuring this out. Oh my God, why are you doing this? It made me stressed just reading this guy. And this the, the article I mentioned was written by one of the engineers that worked on this. And it made me stressed just reading his description of it, even though he seemed very like, okay, we're solving these problems. We're figuring it out. We're being meticulous and thorough and careful. But, uh, oh, it was stressful. Uh, so the packing procedure to actually get the sculpture into this casing was just as carefully planned as the design of the packaging itself. So for that previously broken hand that we mentioned, each of the digits uh, was wrapped in elastic bandage individually, and then they carefully packed foam polystyrene in the gaps between the fingers, and then the whole hand was wrapped again. Uh, That's just one example of sort of the care that they were taking. And the assembly of the wooden crate was carefully choreographed. Like they they had an exact... number of stages and order of stages that like every piece had to be put together as the sculpture was going into the crate. Uh, And at multiple stages, the foam polystyrene, which was in the form of these dilate beads, was added. And again, there is more, more, more detail of this extraordinarily complex and careful effort in the article, which I can't stop talking about to everyone because I'm in love with that article. (laughs) The exterior steel case was painted white with blue markings and orange on top because that's the most easy-to-see color at sea. The case was then escorted extremely slowly on trucks to the dock. Police escorted it there, and it was cabled to the deck of the transport ship with extreme care and precision. And that journey across the ocean, like to get to the docks, to get to the ship, to get across the ocean, to get to New York, was just incredibly kind. Uh, That engineer that wrote that article was saying we did all this work and thankfully our work, like our, um, our skills were never really tested because at no point did the parcel ever shift, like drop unprepared more than a third of a centimeter. So really all of that engineering effort, they were all happy to do it and they were glad it was never really put to the test, but we don't know if they really like did everything perfect. Like if it had fallen, we don't know still if it would have survived or not. Well, and the sea is also, the sea moves a lot. There, I saw a terrifying photograph of this case just strapped to the deck of the ship. Like, it wasn't inside. It was, and that was all part of, like, the plan uh, because it was waterproof and it was determined that that was a safer way to do it than to put it in a cargo hold. But, oh my, I, it was so stressful just to look at these pictures. The Pieta was not the only art that was sent to New York by the Vatican. It traveled along with an even older sculpture, the Good Shepherd, But the Pieta was really the star of the show. It was displayed against a blue-lit background, surrounded by vertical strings of votive lights. Millions of people visited the pavilion to view it, and you can find photographs and home movies taken of of the display online. Yeah, there are lots of those available. If you just do an internet search for uh, Pieta New York World's Fair, you'll instantly see just dozens and dozens of, of, in many cases, really beautifully taken photographs of how it was displayed. And the World's Fair appearance of the Roman Pieta was so incredibly popular that the Vatican started receiving a steady stream of requests for the statue to be loaned for other events. 
and overwhelmed by all of this correspondence and unwilling to take the risk of having this prized work of art on a prolonged tour, the Vatican ended up issuing a statement that Michelangelo's Pietà would stay in St. Peter's permanently once it returned home. Although the no-travel announcement was made in part to keep the Pietà safe, trouble still befell the statue in 1972. Uh, And this was originally the only thing I was going to talk about, but obviously I got interested in lots of other stuff along the way. Uh, So while visiting St. Peter's Basilica in 1972, a 33-year-old Hungarian man named named Laszlo Toth jumped over an altar railing and attacked the Pieta. He was able to hit the statue 12 times with a hammer. Mary's left arm and hand were damaged, the arm was completely severed off, and her nose was broken into three parts. Her left eyelid, head, and neck were also damaged, and when the attack was over, more than 100 fragments had been knocked from the statue. Toth was subdued by tourists and security guards, and he was taken away. He yelled throughout the incident, I am Jesus Christ. Christ is risen from the dead. He went on to claim that God had told him to destroy Mary's image because he, as Laszlo slash Christ, is eternal. He could have no mother. There was a great deal of debate about how to repair the statue and, in fact, whether it should be repaired at all. There were plenty of art historians making the case that it should be left in its damaged state as sort of a a historical record of the attack. Eventually, however, the decision was made to perform a thorough and careful restoration, which would leave no obvious visual clues as to what had happened. Over the course of five months... Fragments and pieces were identified and cataloged. Once that process was complete, a lab was set up around the statue so it could be worked on without removing it from the chapel. And a combination of an invisible glue and marble powder uh, was used as a fixative. And restorers painstakingly placed each broken piece back into position. And they didn't even actually have every missing piece, which they knew based on their months of inventory work that they had done prior to reassembly. I'm so angry. I know. (laughs) I know. This is the part where I'm like, oh, this did get sad at the end for a couple of reasons. One missing piece did arrive in an anonymous parcel from the United States. A visiting tourist who had witnessed the attack took one of the pieces home, but then mailed it back over feeling guilt over the superstitious souvenir. Many other tourists took shards as well, which were never returned. And I would like to say, what is wrong with you? Yeah, I as I was thinking about it, uh, writing up these notes, I was just thinking about how many tiny pieces of the Pieta are spread, no telling where, throughout the globe, uh, which is just a, a an oddly shocking thought to me. Fortunately, a mold of the Pieta had also been made before this attack happened, and using that, the remaining missing pieces were recreated and replaced. So... After 10 months of research and restoration, so remember it took five months just to do the cataloging and then roughly another five to do the the actual reassembly, the sculpture that had made Michelangelo famous was back on display for public viewings. Though, once again, as it had been at the World's Fair, it was placed behind protective bulletproof glass, and it still is. As for Laszlo Toth, his story is patchy and sad. At the time of the attack, he was a former geologist, unemployed at the time of the incident, and deemed to be mentally unstable. He claimed, as he shouted during the assault on the Pietà, to be Jesus Christ and sometimes Michelangelo. And I want to clarify that my what is wrong with you is about non-disturbed people who took pieces of a century-old piece of art home with them. Yeah, that was what I presumed you. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure because I know somebody's going to write us an email about it. And no. I'm talking about the tourists who took pieces of it home. Yeah, 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 yeah. I Like I said, I just imagined how many tiny pieces are spread throughout the world when they should be back with the statue. But uh, yeah, Toth's story is continues to be sad. Uh, in the years prior to this violent outburst, he had moved from Hungary to Australia, although he did not speak any English. Uh, His degree as a geologist was not recognized in Australia, and so he ended up having to work factory jobs. He did, in fact, try to unionize uh, some of those jobs, and and he worked on that until he was in a violent fight in 1967, and in that fight he fractured his skull. He vanished for some time after that injury, and then he would turn up in familiar spots, though only briefly before venturing to Italy in 1972, and it sounds like the people that knew him 
found him to be very different when he he reappeared than he had been prior to that injury. No criminal charges were ever filed against him. He was instead instead sent to a psychiatric institution for two years. When he was released in 1975, he was deported back to Australia. His story goes cold after that. Uh, It's inspired various creative works, and there are certainly corners of the internet where tall tales of sightings and theories about his life after he left Europe just abound. But it appears that Toth all but vanished once he got back to Australia. Yeah, we just, uh, there is like no thread of what happened to him after that, Uh, which is troubling on a variety of levels. Um, So we don't know if he could still be alive, if he, you know, went on to lead a completely different life, if he lives a life of anonymity. We just have no idea. Uh, It it always seemed to me reading about this, because I, I remember, I mean, I was born in the very early 70s, so I remember this was an event that was talked about a lot in my family. My mother's side of the family particularly is very devout Roman Catholic, and and this was something that would come up in conversation often. And I remember, like, I always had questions about the perpetrator, and it, they never had answers, but and now that I have done a little bit more research, it appears no one has answers. And it always seemed sort of cruel that when he got out of a mental institution, he was deported and there was no further care or concern about his treatment. Uh, but yeah, so we don't know. Uh, but what we do know is that Michelangelo's Pietà is still currently on display in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Uh, you can go visit it. And if you can't go visit it in person, like I said, there is a, a Pietà virtual tour that you can uh, visit online and zoom in and see it fairly up close. There's also been a number of just spectacular photographs taken of it over the years. So it is easy to to look at and examine and appreciate the incredible work for yourself. It's it's one of those pieces of sculpture that um, when you hear people talk about it, even people that are not religious speak about it in incredible having an in, just an incredible sense of a sort of otherworldly experience because it is so just indescribably beautiful and sort of moving. So uh, it's a piece I love. I think it's gorgeous. Love to talk about a little bit of art here and there. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today for this classic. If you have heard any kind of email address or maybe a Facebook URL during the course of the episode, that might be obsolete. It might be doubly obsolete because we have changed our email address again. You can now reach us at historypodcast at iheartradio.com and we're all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 